Hello guys and welcome to this Volks Wizard video. Now in today's video I want to share with you a car I hold close to my heart and that's the Mark V Golf GTI. One of the reasons for this is because it was the first GTI to be launched brand new after I started my business here in 2002 buying and selling Golf GTIs. Another reason is because it was seen as a return to form for the Golf GTI after the dark days of the Mark III and Mark IV. But I think this actually underplays the impact this car had because it was massively superior to the Mark IV in every way and back in 2004 it was easily the best Golf GTI of all time when it came to driving pleasure and that's why today it's actually my favourite Golf GTI especially when you take value for money into the equation. The Golf GTI TCR is technically superior but it's also five times more expensive and it's definitely not five times better. So without any further ado let's have a closer look at the Mark V Golf GTI and I'll also give you some buying tips on how to buy one for yourself. Okay guys, I've got not one, but two versions of the Mark V Golf GTI here today. In Tornado Red, we have the standard 200 horsepower car, and in Steel Grey, we have the Edition 30 with 230 horsepower. There is another edition that's worth mentioning, but it's not really worth bringing to the video because it's pretty identical to the Edition 30, and that's the Pirelli Edition. But basically, it's the same mechanicals as the Edition 30, just got a few little trim changes and different wheels. A great car, but if you think it's hard getting an Edition 30 in good condition, you'll find a Pirelli is even harder to find in a good state. Anyway, let's start with looking at the standard car, then we can compare the Edition 30 with that, and then I'll give you some of my buying tips that I've learned over the years, and then we'll go and drive both cars on some brilliant roads around here. So let's start off with the 200 horsepower GTI. When the Mark V Golf GTI came out in late 2004, it was the only Golf to have this big Audi style grille. Every other Golf had a more traditional bumper and grille treatment. So this car looked a lot more aggressive. And there are other little bits and pieces that added to that aggression. So you had black headlights around, you had silt extensions, you had, of course, a cheeky little spoiler. The wheels were unique to the Golf GTI. So these are called Monzas. These are the standard 17 inch wheels in a straight silver. If you ordered them in 18s, They'd be the same style, but they'd be diamond cut. So they're painted gray originally, and then they're machine polished and then lacquered. And they look really good, but they're high maintenance because they do corrode. It's easier to curb your wheels. Tires are more expensive and much more prone to pothole damage. And they do sort of marginally affect the ride going to 18. This 17 inch wheel car is particularly well suited to a UK British B road, as we'll find later. There is one other thing I can't show you on the red car because of the stupid way that I parked it, but you get a lovely twin tailpipe stainless exhaust. It doesn't stay shiny for very long though because they do chuck out a bit of soot from there. But yeah, it's a nice touch. And again, helps the rear end of the car look different to any other Golf because in actually a lot of ways, it's not that different. You don't get tinted rear light clusters. No, there's not an awful lot there to tell. You do get a GTI badge there but really that's quite subtle so little bits make it distinctive without making it too aggressive it's important this car appealed to a big audience so that people would be quite happy taking their kids to school but then other people more enthusiastic drivers like me could buy them and they'd enjoy their sort of individuality and the fact that on a nice British B road you could be one of the quickest cars on the road right let's have a look inside Now, if you were used to Mark IV Golfs, the biggest change with the Mark V was the fact that everything in here was grey and it didn't really give you a sensation of quality which you had with the Mark IV, which is a shame because you can see after 14 years, everything is in really good order. It's done 80,000 miles, this car. Yes, there's a bit of a wear to the bolsters, but look how prominent they are. They go to a point. Now, this car's got the optional Vienna leather. You could have had a standard Tartan, which was again a nice nod to the Mark I Golf GTIs and even the Mark IIs. Um, but again, it looked a bit cheap because where there wasn't Tartan, the fabric on the bolsters was grey and it just didn't look very nice. So this is pretty good. You get a GTI in the headrest there. Other little features are the flat bottom steering wheel. How cool must that have been in 2004? It's even before the RS4 came out with a flat bottom wheel. So it was really Lambos only, I think, at that point. Stainless steel pedals. The spec on these was pretty good as well, so it wasn't just sporty little bits of tinsel here and there. You got auto headlights, which were optional. 
you got climate control which was optional on other cars this car's got I think an extra cost cover on this storage place here other cars don't have that and they do look a bit cheap it's got the DSG gearbox which was optional you get flappy paddles which just imagine how trick these were back in 2004 well, this car's a 2005 it's got cruise control which has been retrofitted on this car but it was an option available from the factory the dials I think are a little bit different to standard but there's nothing on there to say GTI there's nothing on this bit to say GTI in fact there's only really one GTI on the dash anyway and that's here the only other bit is there so that's quite subtle really we've got a black headlining which again adds to the mood of you know sportiness a little mark 5 trick with this bottle opener which is often missing in cars and not only does it open bottles but it also lets you vary the size of this storage space so you can get cans in there or bigger bottles if you move it across this car's got center armrest in there but there's no real infotainment pr provision so there's no usb no aux in you have to wait for mark six to get that let's have a look under the bonnet oh before we do the brakes are really nothing special they're 312 millimeter they're pretty much identical to what the tt mark one had throughout its run they're up to the job on the road on this 200 horsepower car and I suppose they are on the Edition 30 but we'll come to the brakes later on because there's room to upgrade and in some situations it's a good idea to do that. Okay so there we have the 1984cc 197 brake horsepower 200 metric horsepower four cylinder turbocharged engine that's an coded EA113. The engine code on this car is AXX. There is a later one that's the BWA that's basically the same car. There are variations on the cam belt cover that make cam belts a lot easier on the later car and I'm sure there are other changes elsewhere but basically they are the same car. So yeah it's proven pretty reliable. This car's got the DSG box. Again that's proven pretty reliable unlike the TT strangely which predated it only by a year. You get a soundproofing pad, which can often be in bad shape. This one's quite good, but Volkswagen soundproofing pads went downhill after this era of car. I think even the later ones, these are looking a bit tatty. So there we have it. It's a, it's a great engine, as we'll come to when we drive it. On to the Edition 30 then. So I get asked a lot, what are the differences between the standard GTI and the Edition 30? Well, let's start outside first. So as you can see, it has a deeper spoiler which often gets battered and because it's body coloured it chips after just like 40,000 miles they can look really tatty that's one thing the headlights are the same you can have a xenons on either car as an option but they weren't standard on the edition 30. wheel wise we have these 18 inch wheels in the traditional bbs style called pescaras they run 225 40 18 tires as opposed to 225 45 17 on the standard car We've got sill extensions, which are a tiny bit... No, actually, I think they're just... Might be a tiny bit bolder than the ones on the standard car. It's hard to tell because they're painted. At the back, and it's really hard to see unless you really compare them side by side, this kick out here is unique to Edition 30 to give it a bit more muscle. But the rear bumper treatment in every other respect, the exhaust tailpipes, they're the same. Obviously, it's body coloured. If you look at the standard GTI, it doesn't have that kick out here smooth plus it's black obviously is it a bigger sill it's bugging me now i'd say oh yes it is because it's got mm. no i don't know jury's out on that one i'd say if it is it's tiny anyway brakes are the same as these 312 probably okay for the road but the thing about this car is under the bonnet so we'll come to that in a sec the other little tweak on edition 30 is easy to forget when you park like this is that it got cherry red rear light clusters which were from the r32 it's been a tradition after this model right through to the mark 7 uh, mark 7 club sport that the 
limited edition, edition 35, whatever, 30, got the same rear lights as the R models. So yeah, cherry red as opposed to just straight sort of red. This car's got a sunroof. It's a factory option. You could have that on the standard car. Let's have a look inside the Edition 30 then. So this car's steel grey, by the way. There was no interior trim option. You had the mixture of leather and tartan, which is the perfect thing for an enthusiast like me because it gives you the retro look, but it doesn't give you the sort of the cheapness of the standard seats. Plus you get red stitching, which livens it up. That car doesn't have the red stitching in the seats. No, it's a shame that, because it would have really improved things. Got the same flat bottom steering wheel with the same red trim around it. Or has it, actually? No. Hmm, interesting. So yeah, this car's got the red trim around the steering wheel, which we don't have on the standard car. Same aluminium badge down there, same, same stainless steel pedals. It's got Edition 30 on the sill cover there, which that car hasn't got anything on there. It's just got a sill cover, no GTI or anything. Every UK Edition 30 had a unique badge, but I don't think that applied anywhere else. This was, you had to apply for them with Volkswagen UK. So I don't know why that was such a big deal here and not anywhere else. Because there's a bit of leather in the seats, you've got seat heating as standard. These are the correct floor mats with a red edging on this car. You just got gray. So a bit of red around there would have actually livened that up quite a lot. The effect of which is that the gray in here doesn't seem as cheap as in the standard car. The other difference is that we've got the RNS 510 head unit which was only available towards the end of the Mark 5 Golf production. There was a nav unit available on earlier cars which had loads of silver buttons down here but this is amazing it's like as good as most modern ones because it's it's touch screen when it wakes up. So this is a really good nav system and it lifts sort of the ambience of the cabin. This car's got the multi-function steering wheel and it's got the Highline trip computer, which means it's just a big screen there. What it usually means as well is that it's easy to convert this car to cruise control because multifunction steering wheel usually means the electronics are there for cruise, even though this car doesn't have it. We've got the golf ball gear knob, which I don't think was on any other model. We haven't got a center console here. We do actually have aux in. So this was such a late car, it actually got the Mark VI infotainment in that respect but it didn't have like a usb port come to think of it there was an ipod dock you could order instead of the cd changer that was here and it, you just slotted your ipod into it and but they were highly unreliable and very expensive to replace you get a unique book pack on the edition 30 which you don't get on the standard car oh and you get a rather cheap looking Edition 30 sticker on the aluminium dash inlay. Let's have a look under the bonnet because this is where it matters for the Edition 30. Mechanically, there is no other difference. I think suspension and brakes, exhaust, everything is the same as on the standard car. Under here, whilst it looks the same as the 200 horsepower car, it's got a different engine code for a start. This is BYD and it varies in a very important way in that it's got a big turbo. It's got the KO4, that's the KO3 and it's got different injectors, different fuel pumps. So it's basically the next version up of this engine, but it's been detuned. So it's not identical to that in the S3, which was 265 horsepower, but it's as good as identical and it remaps as well as an F3. So F3s do 300 horsepower with a stage one map, no problem. This car would jump from 230 to 300 just with a stage one map. It was almost like the, the product planners wanted to give enthusiasts like me a present by giving you the ability to remap your car. And amazingly, it's proven really durable. You may not know, but I ran an Edition 30 project car as a track car in 2017 and 18. It had done 80 something thousand miles the hard way. It was mapped early on in its life. I drove it very hard and it didn't miss a beat. So I don't trust modern engines as much as I trust this one. The only downside is they're actually quite thirsty. So my Edition 30 would do high 20s, even on a run. On track days, it was pretty terrible. I'd spend more money on fuel than I would on going into the track days. Um, this engine is a bit more thirsty than this one as well. So this would probably be low 30s. 
and this would be probably high 20s slightly lower 30s than that one big progress was made with the mark 6 when it came to fuel consumption but unfortunately the standard mark 6 got a change of an engine which was really unreliable so you spend money on fixing that engine that you'd never gain back with the fuel consumption these cars and the edition 35 mark 6 are all cam belt engines so every five years or 80,000 miles you've got to spend 350 on a cam belt on a water pump but at least you know every time you do it it's brand new while a changer of an engine will fail at some point usually good for the life of the engine they say well yeah but how long is that engine going to be alive for i don't think there's much else to tell you about these cars there's probably stuff i've missed so apologies for that but it's time now to get on and drive them Sorry guys, before we move on to the driving, I did promise I'd give you some buying tips. I've been buying these cars now for 14 years since they were a year old and I still get caught out with bits and pieces today. My biggest tip is to take somebody with you who knows what they're doing because they can save you a lot of money. They are generally reliable, but they're 14 to 15 years old now and that means the, the difference in condition of those on the market can, can vary wildly. And if you can't tell the difference, then you could end up buying yourself a lot of trouble. Another good tip is to make sure, even before you set off, that you check the mileage on the MOT database. It's a free check on the government website. Just search MOT history, put them reg in, and it will give you all the MOT histories. These came out in 04, first MOTs were 07. I think the computerized system started in 07, so pretty much every Mark V GTI MOT mileage will be available to you on that free service. So please do check that because they wear their mileage really well and a lot of them will be clocked. Obviously HPI check very carefully and I've got a few other little tips here. Well service history is really important. Um, I wouldn't really want a car that's done more than 12,000 miles between services. It doesn't matter if it's been over two years, it doesn't really matter but you don't want an engine that's been run on old oil because it's a very sensitive engine so just check the history very carefully. Verify it if you can, ring the dealers, ring the garages, just check it's legit. Also with a DSG car there is an oil change every 40,000 miles. You need to make sure that's been done there or thereabouts. Dealers are very bad at advising for this oil change to be done. So some cars run 50 or upwards before it's done. It doesn't really matter if it's gone beyond about, well, I don't know, 45 to 50, if the car's had an EV life. So this one was done at 47, but it had a retired lady owner. She lived in rural Northamptonshire. It would have had an easy life on that gearbox, unlike a car that lived in London which would have been stopped starting. The oil quality would have degraded very, very quickly. So you have to play it by ear, but wouldn't, don't write a car off if the DSG oil change is a bit late, but obviously make sure you drive it hot and cold. That's what I really need to tell you, that DSG boxes vary from hot and cold. So just make sure you're happy with it, both hot and cold, get it properly hot, insist on a proper test drive, because if a DSG box isn't working properly, it could be thousands to, to sort out. Okay, so let's have a look at the car then. So. They are vulnerable to corroded wings. Have a good look. Seems to be the offside that's worse. Put your hand under there, have a good feel. The reason for that is that in here, to dampen noise, there's a sponge and that sponge gets wet. It's only just the other side of the wheel arch liner and it sits on that metal wing forever, never really dries out and eventually even the good quality steel that they use corrodes. So that's not ideal. Now don't ignore the back arches as well. These are, haven't got the sponge, but they can be prone to stone chips if people have fitted bigger wheels or spacers, they move the tyre out and therefore stone chips just chip away at here and corrosion sets in. Speaking of chips, because the bonnet is constantly at an angle, it's never really flat, it does get a bit of a battering from stone chips. Also the headlights, I think particularly the non-Xenons like on this car, they can go a bit misty, which can be restored with a restoration kit like Maguire, I think they're all making them now. Another little tip is that just to check the headlights have got the VW logo in them because the aftermarket ones aren't allowed to use that, even if they're made by the same company that supplied them to VW, because they're not a genuine part, they can't use that. So you can tell if it's had headlights by whether the VW logo is present. A lot of people will replace them if they're misty with uh, like a Bosch alternative and they won't have the VW logo. So don't panic, but it's a good little check to do. Right, what else have we got? Well, wheels, obviously, especially with the 18 inch Monzas that are diamond cut, it's about 100 quid each to get them refurbished if they're corroded or curbed. So just check the wheels carefully. Tires, you're looking about 70 to 120 quid, depending on whether it's 17 inch or 18 inch. The biggest tip I can give you though, is to check that the owner hasn't fitted cheap tires, because if he has, 
He's undone all the great work that the chassis engineers did when they were developing these cars and it probably saved money elsewhere that won't be immediately apparent. So just beware of a car with, I don't know, some elderly Continentals on the back and then some cheap sort of rubbish on the front. These are Falcons, so these are £71 fitted. They're an OEM brand. They're a brilliant tyre. Now they're running this car goes around corners like it never did before on its old Contis. What else have we got? Okay, that's all on the outside. Inside, there's a few things really. Just have a look at the bolsters. A bit of a patina like on here isn't the end of the world, but if the leathers hold, it's going to be a lot of money to fix that. The cloth as well wears here because the bolsters are so pointy. So it's not really surprising, but you don't really want to have to get it retrimmed. A big issue is air conditioning, so make sure it works. It's going to be hard to do that in the winter, but you have no excuse in the summer. Below about five degrees, the aircon system won't work, so you need a diagnostic scan to tell you if there's a fault code. It's worth doing a diagnostic scan regardless, really, because you'll find stuff you wouldn't otherwise know. If the car's got the factory-fitted iPod dock, which would be in the centre armrest like here, if you actually want to use it, make sure it works, because quite often they don't, and they're a few hundred quid to replace so that's really kind of expensive but I don't think many people will be using those old Apple connectors but I could be wrong what else have we got no. oh yeah no it's pretty good the air conditioning can either be the pump you need to listen for a whining noise so at about 2000 rpm when the pump's going they whine now you might be lucky in that if you turn the air con off by putting it into econ mode like that if the whining go goes away all you need to do is regas the air conditioning it should go quieter if you leave it with that noisiness for too long though you'll end up knackering it and the whininess won't go away and you'll need a new pump and another little tip is if somebody tells you the aircon doesn't work because it needs regassing get them to regas it and then see then because i've heard that so many times and more often than not it's not that case it's either the pump's gone or the aircon condenser which is at the front of the bonnet has gone but generally they're pretty good oh, if you've got a multi cd changer and you want to play cds just make sure it works because they can go wrong quite frequently as well heated seats check they work they're pretty reliable i have known one almost catch fire to the seat and nearly burn the driver that was a cloth car where the wiring i think had got snagged a bit that's quite unusual check for engine management lights check that the idle is smooth and not high if it's over a thousand rpm it could be a problem with the PCV, the positive crankcase ventilation valve, which sits under the engine cover. I can't really show you because I have to strip the car down, but it's down here. It's only a few bolts hold it in place, about 45 quid. M money well spent replacing that. This car actually had that. What it did was it was idling a bit high, and then about a week later it put the engine management light on, and I went straight to the PCV and it sorted it. Another problem was that this engine cover was new to VW Mechanics in 2004, so nobody really knew how to take it off, and they do crack them somewhere around there. So you just need to be wary of that. There's not much you can do about it. It doesn't affect the way the car drives, but it's a bit unsightly. The other thing is the cam follower. It's, you can probably just about see a piece of metal down there, and that's the high-pressure fuel pump. And the way that's driven is using a follower which transmits the energy of the camshaft to the pump to drive it it's just a little bit of metal and they can wear and when they wear you have big problems if they fail because you'll probably need a top end like a, a cylinder head or something like that because the camshaft will be knackered so it's good practice to take them out it's not hard even though it's a fuel pump there's no real fuel loss or anything like that um, and then take it out and just check it and if it's not worn put it back in or just buy another one and fit one they're about 40 quid i think um, but for peace of mind it's worth doing generally the engine is very reliable it can sound a bit diesely shouldn't be excessively diesely in the way it sounds we do have like a tick, 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 tick. that's mainly the injectors there is a cam chain tensioner on these engines that i've heard can break but there must be stories i mean somebody said it's got like full dealer history and stuff but it must have had a hard life for it to break so if it sounds a bit excessively diesely walk away i think right now it's raining i think it's a good time to get in the car and go driving okay guys so here we are behind the wheel of a mark 5 golf gti dsg this is actually my good lady wife's car she loves it because it's just so easy to drive it's got plenty of power and i love it because 
if I don't fancy driving the R8 on a weekend, I quite enjoy driving this. I'll probably enjoy it even more, believe it or not. Now, first impressions is that it does not feel 10 years behind a Mark 7 Golf GTI. And that's probably partly to do with the fact that the chassis engineer behind this car was the same guy behind the Mark 7, Carsten Shepstadt. He did the Club Sport S as well, and he did some good Porsches. He even did the Mark 1 Focus, which is not a particularly exciting car, but it was a benchmark for chassis development. DSG as well, even though this gearbox in this car is 14 years old, it's, I can't imagine anything changing gear any more quickly or any more smoothly, it's remarkable. There was a lot of controversy about a GTI having an auto when it came out, but it makes perfect sense because it just makes it more practical, which is what GTI is all about, a combination of performance and practicality. But the real magic with the Mark V was the chassis. Gone was the torsion beam rear axle, in its place was the independent rear suspension. And that just means on a road like this, which is very challenging, there's not an awful lot that can touch it in the dry anyway. I mean, that just felt beautiful, lovely and neutral. They're so neutral that if you put bad tyres on the back and good on the front, you will find they will lift off oversteer quite frighteningly. The engine, again, it's just got torque everywhere, to quote Clarkson, and it does like to rev. So yeah, it goes pretty well. It's not too bad on fuel either. Where progress has taken place is with efficiency, so you'll find that the Mark 7s and even the Mark 6s are a lot better on fuel than this car. This car will be sort of low 30s and the addition 30 is probably about 10% worse, I think, and a lot worse if you tune it, which a lot of people do. But can it be even better to drive than this car? Well, there's only one way to find out. Let's go and drive the Mark 5 Golf GTI edition 30. Okay guys, here we are behind the wheel of the Mark 5 Golf GTI edition 30. And the big difference is that we've got a manual gearbox. You could have DSG, but a lot of these cars were manual still. It was 10 years ago when it came out, so DSG hadn't really taken off then like it had with the Mark 7 Golfs. It's a really nice gearbox as well. It seems to be pretty tough. My track day car had 80,000 miles on it, and I think it was the original clutch, and there was no sign of slip even with a stage one remap. In every other way, it feels pretty similar. The ride's a little bit more turbulent on these 18-inch wheels, but it's not banging or crashing. It's still pretty good on this B road. Surprisingly, the brakes, the suspension, it's all the same between standard Golf GTI and Edition 30. So if you like the chassis in the Mark V, actually it was hard to improve on it. I think suspension kit manufacturers drove that car and thought, what can we do unless somebody wants to make it drive worse by lowering it? So yeah, it still goes round corners pretty well. We're on new Contis on the front of this car, so probably not going to push it because they're not running yet, but you can still feel the magic. <laughs> so the big difference is the engine. It's a little bit laggy because we're running a bigger turbo. It's slightly less linear than that in the normal car, but the DSG made that car feel almost as fast. There isn't an awful lot in it, but when you map these, they are incredible. I'll put a link on screen now to my track day video when I was chasing a Porsche Cayman R around Bedford and catching it. So yeah, the Edition 30 is a brilliant car for the enthusiast. It's the only problem with it now is that it's worth quite a bit more than the standard GTI and I don't really think it's worth paying the extra unless you want to modify it and then when you start to map it you've really got to change the brakes because they're, they are undernourished for that kind of level of performance. They're only marginal with the standard 230. But it's still a brilliant car. Which one would I go for? I think I'd rather buy a really good standard GTI than a slightly iffy Edition 30 for the same money. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this Volks Wizard video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. Please comment, please share, please subscribe. And I'll see you for the next one really soon.